Yes. So just so that you know that uh, these uh, classes are recorded as usual and put up, the audio will be put up. So, Bhagavad Gita class, we were studying uh, the third chapter. We had done the second chapter and then we were studying the third chapter where we stopped last year. It's been a more or less one year since we have had the Gita classes. And uh, um, I, uh, I continued my uh, Gita studies. Actually, at, at uh, Harvard, uh, the Divinity School, there was one course on the Bhagavad Gita which I took. So we studied the Bhagavad Gita with the commentary of Madhusudan Saraswati, which is a very comprehensive uh, commentary, very nice, very beautiful commentary. Um, so that that will also explain if Madhusudan keeps coming in once in a while uh, or quite often in my uh, explanations. Um, okay, let me just get this out of the way. At the end of the second chapter, what had uh, we had seen was Sri Krishna in response to Arjuna's question about what his duty is in this uh, battlefield. Um, Sri Krishna taught him Vedanta, Atma Jnana, the knowledge of the self, that you are not the body, not the mind, um, the, uh, you are the Atman, which is immortal, which cannot be destroyed by any weapon, um, which is uh, uh, unchanging, which is of the nature of uh, existence, consciousness, bliss. And all of this, whatever you experience, is an appearance in this Atman. And this is to be realized once you realize this, one, uh, one goes beyond sorrow, one attains uh, peace and fulfillment. And that's the ultimate goal of human life, uh, enlightenment leading to moksha, spiritual liberation. And then Krishna went on to tell Arjuna that you must engage in action. That means uh, you, you must fight this battle. Oh, one second. Uh, you must f fight this uh, battle. Why... Uh, Wait, one second, I just adjust this a little bit, my screen to my comfort. Um, yes, so one must fight this battle. Karma, one must do one's duty uh, in a detached way. And then finally he ended by uh, saying, by realizing that you are the Atman, you become free. And the last verse was, Esha Brahmi Stiti Partha, Nainam Prapya Vimuhyati. Attaining this state of Brahman. State of Brahman means realizing that you are Brahman. Having attained this, one does not enter into delusion anymore. One does not uh, enter into the cycle of birth and death. One does not suffer anymore. Uh, so that's, that's where he ended. But this left Arjuna confused. Why? Because he heard two things. One is the path of knowledge. That I do not know this amazing, this wonderful thing about myself. Uh, that, that I am an extraordinary spiritual being, that I am consciousness and immortal existence and always fulfilled. Sat, Chit, Ananda. I am not this body of flesh and blood. So this extraordinary thing that, uh, that we could be unaware of such a thing about ourselves. So this was the path of knowledge. By the path of knowledge, one realizes this. This is one thing which Arjuna heard. And the second thing he heard was the path of action. You have to do your duty and do it in a detached way. Uh, you have right to the action alone, not to the fruits of that. Do not give up action. Uh, do your action without attachment to the, to the fruits of action. So he was confused. He thought Krishna was telling him two things, two alternative things. The path of knowledge, Jnana Yoga, the path of action, Karma Yoga. And naturally he wanted to know, um, which one should I do? Um, he starts this, the third chapter with a question. The third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita starts with a question from Arjuna. Jayasi jet karmanaste matabuddhir janardana. If you think that um, the uh, jnana yoga is superior to karma yoga, because it leads to enlightenment, it leads to moksha. Tatkim karmani ghore maam niyo jayasi keshava. So why are you engaging me in this terrible action? That means right now what, what we are going to do, this battlefield. And tell me one. So keep it simple. Don't confuse me with all, all this uh, you know, different options. Give me one thing to do which is good for me. Uh, which is Shreyoham. That means I will attain the highest goal. What is the highest welfare in human life? Moksha. Tell me how do I do that? 
And they remember Krishna answered this by saying, you have misunderstood me. I did not say that these are two options. I taught one spiritual path, one integral spiritual path of which these are aspects or parts. You see, karma yoga, we know the structure. Karma yoga leads to purification of the mind and then there will be meditation which leads to concentration of the mind. With the purified and concentrated mind, jnana yoga becomes effective. That means then it leads to enlightenment. We have talked about this again and again. Um, that's the structure of sadhana according to uh, Advaita Vedanta. See, in Sanatana Dharma, it's never this exclusive. It's always, uh, all the paths are included. It's always an integral approach. Whether it is Shankara's Advaita Vedanta or Ramanuja's Vishishta Advaita or Madhva's Advaita Vedanta, there will be an aspect of bhakti, there will be an aspect of karma, uh, action, there will be an aspect of knowledge, meditation. So all of them are there. Depending on the philosophical structure, one of them is played up, others are made sub subservient. And in the path of Advaita Vedanta, um, jnana, knowledge, is the one which leads to enlightenment, to, to realization. Why? Because it's the problem is ignorance. If the problem is ignorance, the solution is knowledge. But not straight away. For that, there's a preparation necessary. necessary. Knowledge comes in this mind. Uh, you have to work with this body and mind to purify the personality, the mind, the subconscious um, mental structure has to be purified of desire and, uh, uh, and uh, distraction. Then only Vedanta becomes useful. You see, when we go to Advaita Vedanta, the first thing we are told, fourfold qualification. By now, most of you must have heard it again and again till you are sick of it. Viveka, Vairagya, the sixfold treasure and Mumukshutvam, intense desire to be free. Those come when the mind is sufficiently purified. So the purification of the mind, karma yoga is absolutely essential. That's what Shankara explains throughout. Sri Krishna teaches that and Shankara explains why this emphasis on karma in the, Bhag in the Bhagavad Gita. Because it is indispensable for spiritual life. So Arjuna had misunderstood. It's like I want to fly to Mumbai. So you, t so you will tell me, all right, take a, not now, it's not possible now, but uh, so you take a cab to JFK and then take a flight to Mumbai or Delhi, then you can go to India that way. Now if I say, tell me one, either cab or aeroplane, which one? You say, no, no, you misunderstood me. The entire journey is an integrated journey of which the first part has to be by a, a car to the airport and then the second part has to be by the aeroplane. Uh, aeroplane is Jnana Yoga. From aeroplane, you have to complete your journey. So both are essential. They are not options. Um, even Swami Vivekananda, when he said these are the four paths, he did say each of them can take you to the, uh, to the uh, goal. Karma, Bhakti, Jnana, Meditation. And in fact, if you look at the Shastras, the classic Shastra for meditation is Patanjali Yoga Sutras. Classic Shastra maybe for Bhakti, for example, is the Naradiya Bhakti Sutra, for example. None of them ever say that we are one step in the way and the other, then you have to, after this, you have to go to some other, you know, complete meditation and then you have to study, um, you know, Drigdrishya, Viveka or Aparokshana, Bhuti, then only you will get moksha. No, each of them claim that by what we are teaching, by that itself you will get moksha. True. But Swami Vivekananda, remember, what he ultimately recommended was a harmony of the four paths. Uh, he said it is much, it is, it is the best option is to have all four in your life. It is the safest, most powerful, most convenient, most natural. And he, among those four, one may be more to your liking, more maybe more suited to your mental makeup, and you'll see automatically that will become predominant. But it's good to have all four. It's in the same way, Krishna says that karma yoga is essential. So the section which we are reading, we had done verse number 27 last time, I think when we completed. So the section which we are reading was, Krishna was saying to Arjuna that, um, what about after enlightenment? After enlightenment, do I still have to do action? And he says, yes. Why? For the welfare of others. So he gives a particular argument that, Yadyadacharati Shreshta, whatever the wise one, enlightened one, whomever we consider superior or excellent in our 
in just it need not just be in spiritual life it could be in family life it could be in in at work the person whom we consider to be superior or excellent is the person we tend to imitate so the 21st verse um, Sri Krishna is starting a section where he's telling Arjuna that even after enlightenment one does work uh, we have done all this whatever the uh, superior person does all others follow that person and therefore the enlightened one has a special responsibility to act in such a way that it will inspire everybody to, um, to follow dharma um, he gives the example of Janaka. He says, people like Janaka attained enlightenment through action only. And look at me, he gives his own example. That I have nothing to attain through action in the three worlds. Name parthasti kartavyam trishu lokeshu kinchana. In the three worlds, I have nothing to be attained, no duty to be done. And yet, I am continuously, Krishna is continuously engaged in uh, doing good in, in, in action. So, why? If I do not do uh, what I am supposed to do, then people will imitate me and this will lead to chaos and destruction of society and civilization. How should the enlightened person act? Just as the unenlightened, the ordinary people act out of attachment, out of desire. Let the enlightened people do their duty without attachment, without desire. For what purpose? If you have no purpose, then why would you do? There is a purpose. Loka Sangraham, Chikirshu Loka Sangraham. Loka Sangram means welfare of everybody. So, desiring to set an example, inspiring people, uh, he says, Joshayet uh, Sarva Karmani, encourage people in moral, ethical action, in the spiritual life. You as an enlightened person may not need Karma Yoga, but everybody else needs Karma Yoga. So, you engage in Karma Yoga. You may not need ritualistic worship, but many people do. That's the place where we start spiritual life. So, you also, the enlightened person also should engage in um, as an example to others. I remember a story of Swami Jagadananda. He was a disciple of the Holy Mother, Mashada Devi's disciple. And one of my teachers, uh, Jushtananda Ji, Shubhrata Maharaj, had seen Jagadananda many years ago, uh, or he had heard this story. So, Jagadananda was, a very, um, even in his lifetime, he was regarded as an uh, enlightened person, as a Jivan Mukta. Um, he is... Uh, he is the translator of the great master, Sri Sri Lila Prashanga, the, the English first in the English translation. Right now we have a wonderful translation by Swami Chetanarandaji, but the English translation before that was by Swami Jagadarandaji. So this great Swami. And also some of us, we know the story that when the Holy Mother visited Belurmat and she saw the brahmacharis and the sadhus, um, you know, cutting vegetables, dressing the vegetables, and she praised them. So how nicely the boys are um, cutting vegetables, you know, cutting the vegetables or dressing the vegetables. Um, and a monk said to her that whether it is by spiritual practices or by cutting vegetables, the goal is to please the Divine Mother, which means her, of course. She didn't say anything. She smiled. The, the Swami who said this to her was Swami Jagadananda. He was standing there at that time. So this is Swami Jagadananda. But why am I telling you this story? The story is this that um, uh, many, many years ago, decades ago, in our ashram Dehradun, in uh, Kishanpur, there's an ashram just outside Dehradun. So, Swami Jagadanji was in there in his old age. And one brahmachari saw this great Swami, um, you know, plucking flowers for the worship, morning worship in the shrine. He was going in the garden and plucking flowers and collecting flowers for the morning worship just to sub help the pujari, the worshipper. And this brahmachari was uh, puzzled. He went and asked the Swami, Swami, you are such a great Vedantin. You are a Jeevan Mukta. He didn't say that, but he said, you are such a great Vedantin. Why are you plucking flowers? So the idea in the mind of the brahmachari is a great Vedantin will probably be studying the Upanishads, giving lectures or sitting in meditation, you know, something like that. Plucking flowers for the daily worship of uh, Sri Ramakrishna in the temple, that's like a beginner's thing. Why would such a person do it? So why are you plucking flowers? Now the Swami, it seems he had a very sweet smile and he was very tall. So he looked down with that classic smile and he said, then my boy, tell me what should I do? In Bengali, Tahole tumi walo ami ki kori? 
Now, what does it mean? That there is a, a misconception in our uh, mind about what action an enlightened person can do or whether an enlightened person should do any kind of practice at all. After all, they are beyond all these things. No, the enlightened person does this practice. One reason is, as Krishna says, as an encouragement to everybody else. And of course, it's also an expression of their enlightenment. The same reality whom they realize as Aham Brahmasmi, the same reality they see as uh, Sri Ramakrishna in the temple. Same worship which you do through Upanishadic studies, whether it's mantra japa, meditation, samadhi, is also done through puja. Mm. Let me share this here, interesting insight, otherwise I'll forget. Um, so we had this very interesting class with Professor Arindam Chakravarti on Kashmir Shaivism. And before and after the class, sometimes the professor calls me with sudden insights, so which are very valuable. Uh, worship of the image. Uh, and he, he suddenly called me with great excitement. He said, you know, it is true. Worship of the image, idol worship. You know, Hindus are criticized for idol worship. It, but what is this idol? And he said, it's I doll. I and <laughs> doll. It's a doll of the eye. The I consciousness within is objectified here as this particular image. Uh, any form of Saguna Brahman, God with qualities. So I doll, I never thought of that. <laughs> so that is also a, um, an expression of the same spirituality, same realization. Anyway, so na buddhi vedam janayet, do not confuse people by saying no. You need not, why are you remaining in samsara? Become a monk, go to the Himalayas, sit and meditate in samadhi. Uh, why are you reading, the, why are you going to a temple? Why are you repeating uh, mantra of Ishta Devata? You are Brahman, whom are you worshipping? If you say these things, it puts people in total confusion. It's actually harmful to spiritual practice, to a spiritual path. You will meet such characters in the high Himalayas. One of our monks, he was on a pilgrimage to, I think, Badrinath or somewhere. So they have to stop on the way. In those days, they had to stop and they would stay in a tent uh, at night. So he sat down in his tent, co covered with himself with a blanket, it's cold, and was doing his mantra japa, evening repetition of the mantra. And one of the traditional non-dualistic swamis who was there, he poked his head into the tent and he looked at this sadhu up, up and down and he said, What? Even now you are repeating a mantra. Kya abhivi upasana Mahatma ji? Even now you are doing upasana of God. You are Brahman. That's the idea actually. So, kya abhivi upasana? Krishna says, never do such things. Na buddhi bhedam janayet. Sri Ramakrishna was very particular about this. He used to say, bhav nashto kurtini. Don't destroy anybody's spiritual um, progress, spiritual path. Once you are surrounded by a group of devotees and uh, a pandit had come, a, a scholar. And uh, this scholar, once the scholar was a little mischievous or a little sarcastic. So one devotee was, was a very simple devotee with a lot of devotion to God, and the pandit started questioning this God. How do you know that God exists? What is the proof? Um, and like this, after some time, Sri Ramakrishna became very annoyed, and he told the pandit, he said, "You call yourself a pandit? You are harming that poor person's bhakti, devotion to God." He said, Koto janme punne ektu bhagavani bhakti hai. With the lot of the merits of so many births, of doing good in so many births, that accumulated merit uh, develops into little devotion for God, little faith in God. And here you are, you call yourself a pandit, a scholar, and you are damaging the faith of the simple man. Shame on you. And the pandit slunk away, got up, he was embarrassed, and he sort of walked away, left. The 27th verse. So what is it that the enlightened person knows and the unenlightened person does not know and gets trapped in action? So the 27th verse was Prakriti kriyamanani gunei karmani sarvasha ahankara vimodatma kartaham iti manyate All action in the world is done by prakriti or the gunas of prakriti. Prakriti, nature. And nature is composed of three gunas. We know this. Waking, uh, sorry, <laughs> I am so used to mandukya. Sattva Rajas Tamas and all the products of Prakriti are um, also composed of these three gunas, especially this body and mind. So this body is made of the three gunas, it's material. Uh, 
Even the mind according to Vedanta, Sankhya, all the Indian philosophies is material. It's made of the constituents of Prakriti. And all action is done by these material entities. So what is action? World made of Prakriti, body made of Prakriti, and mind made of Prakriti, senses made of Prakriti. These are the ones which interact. And the in unenlightened person not knowing that, uh, that my real nature is Atman, pure consciousness, gets under the sway of ego. What is ego? That which, which, uh, which uh, um, you know, unifies body and mind and, and says, I am the doer, I am the one who's speaking, I am the one who's talking, I am the one who's thinking, I desire, I love, I want, I remember. All activities of the body, all activities of the mind are integrated. There's a word appropriated. So the ego appropriates everything. Thoughts in the mind, I am thinking. Eyes are seeing something, I see. The body is walking, I walk. A desire comes up from the subconscious mind, I want. So this ego, deluded by this ego, the Atman thinks through the mind that I am this body and mind and I am acting. Ahankara vimur Atma karta hamiti manyate. Deluded by the ego, which is a part of the body mind, which is all Prakriti, thinks that I am acting. Action done by Prakriti through body and mind in a material world. Consciousness, which is entirely separate from this, thinks I am the doer. So this is what we had done uh, till uh, we had done till 27th verse. Now we shall go ahead uh, quickly. Is there any particular question right now? No. All right. Yes. Yes. Ah, Prabhu Babu, please. Maharaj Pranam, sorry, I think we completed up to verse 16, and not 27. No, no, no. We had done. Uh, lecture, we finished the lecture Therma 30. And no. that was up to verse 16. Uh, At least. No, as far as I remember. Uh, uh, Prakyat, uh, can you uh, look it up? I think it was 20. Was it 27? Soundcloud, you have up to. Yeah, yeah. If you go to Soundcloud, you will see. Uh, up to 27. Yeah, and there is one more if, uh, feedback coming in. It's up to verse 29 we have done. <laughs> no, we are. Yes, um, so we had definitely done um, 27 and um, 28 and 29 are just follow up to that. So we are going to um, go ahead. We just quickly touch on 27, 28 and then uh, 28, 29 and then go to 30. So we have done this. Um, that was the last class. You look up uh, SoundCloud or this, this audio recordings where they are available. You will see those have been done. All right, let us go ahead. Was there anybody else? There's one more. Yes. Uh, Devanik. Devanik. Maharaj uh, Pranam. Yes. Uh, question. Uh, the Prakriti works through the mind and the body, right? Yes. So, uh, when this thought of I do arises in the mind, yes. it's also a reflection of the Prakriti? Yes, it, it is because of the Prakriti. Yes. How does the Atman, who is the non-doer, get entangled in this uh, I-do scenario? Yeah, and that is the mystery, isn't it? So we start there, we are already entangled there. And so how do we see the difference between Prakriti and ourselves, the Atman? And remember, getting entangled and getting free, both are in the mind. The Atman in itself is ever free. It's only using the mind that, you know, it's like, Reflecting this truth in the mind that I, the Atman, am ever free of Prakriti, of body and mind. Action goes on at the level of body and mind. Till now I was thinking, I am this. Now instructed by Krishna, instructed by Vedanta, I am aware of a deeper dimension to myself which is not involved in body-mind. So does the, does the mind which is Prakriti kind of realizes itself to be separate from the consciousness that is shining through it? Yes. Um, actually... It sounds peculiar, how does the mind realize itself, but it's consciousness, uh, the mind illumined by consciousness, consciousness plus mind. It's like, um, it's like a very good example is, when I say, I am happy, I am happy. Who is saying this? Actually, if you see physically, it's the tongue which is saying it, the vocal apparatus, I am happy. But 
it refers to the mind where is happiness happiness is not on the tongue or in the voice box happiness is in the mind mind cannot speak so the mind uses the vocal apparatus to express its happiness similarly atman itself does not think or get confused or uh, get realized also yeah. all the ignorance is in the mind but it refers to the atman so in uh, some sense it's yeah. a prakriti that gets liberated no no prakriti does not get liberated the atman who was under the confusion that i am one with prakriti realizes that i am not one with prakriti and both the ignorance confusion and the enlightenment both are at the level of intellect uh, of the mind which is part of prakriti so prakriti in sankhya for example prakriti does two things involving the atman in action it gives the result bhoga and also gives liberating knowledge finally Li- liberates the atman from itself prakriti never is neither, neither bound nor liberated prakriti is ma- matter is material yeah it's just this physical universe physical and subtle universe now if the unenlightened person is getting trapped in prakriti in this way what does the how is the enlightened person different An unenlightened person gets trapped by the action um, performed by the body and mind in the material world and thinking itself to be the body and mind but then what is the difference about uh, where how does the enlightened person act 28th verse so i hope all of you have got some text any text will do as long as it has got the original bhagavad gita तत्वित्तु महाबाहो गुणकर्मा विभागयो गुणागुणेषु वर्तन्ते इति मत्वा न सज्जते सो ओ ग्रेट वॉरियर ऑन द कॉन्ट्ररी द नोअर ऑफ द ट्रुथ ऑफ द डिस्टिंक्शन बिटवीन द कॉन्स्टिट्यूएंट्स ऑफ प्रकृति एंड देयर ऑपरेशंस डज नॉट अटैच हिमसेल्फ टू वर्क्स नोइंग दैट द कॉन्स्टिट्यूएंट्स ऑपरेट अमिड्स कॉन्स्टिट्यूएंट्स इट्स इट साउंड्स very dry in english constituents operator <laughs> constituents tu tattva vittu tu means to distinguish tu means but but to distinguish the enlightened person from the unenlightened person what's the difference prakriti guna this term prakriti guna means body mind prakriti is is nature and guna means its constituents and it means the products of nature the entire cosmos material universe the body and the mind including the senses the motor organs sense organs and the um the uh, mind intellect memory and ego all of that is prakriti the actions performed by the body and mind are also prakriti the objects which the body and mind interact with are also prakriti and so this is how um the enlightened person knows he says guna karma vibhagayo knows the this distinction of the gunas gunas means prakriti guna prakriti guna i remember it means body mind specifically here it means body mind everything in the cosmos is prakriti guna but here specifically body mind so it knows the distinction between prakriti guna that means body mind karma the activities performed by this body mind and what is the knowledge of the enlightened one neither of them is atma i am not the world obviously not i am not the actions i perform nor am i this body and mind through which actions are performed this is the knowledge of the enlightened one does the enlightened one stop action then no guna guneshu vartanta objects are interacting with objects i am the witness of it all so action goes on see when the i i this suppose this is the body mind and this is the world and action is when they interact whether i am interacting with the world and this is this is action this is ignorance if i say no i will not interact with the world i will stop action i will sit uh, in a cave and meditate i will not get involved in any kind of activity like arjuna said i will not fight this war this is also ignorance because in both cases i the consciousness i think i am this body mind so you see activity under ignorance and withdrawing from activity under ignorance both are in karma both are in prakriti both are ignorance only guna guneshu vartante iti matvana sajjate the gunas body mind guneshu objects body mind is interacting with objects that is action knowing this iti matva knowing this the enlightened one does not get caught up is is never attached to this 
Um, this is what I want to do, this is what I don't want, this is good, that is bad. These two are not me. Neither the body mind is me, nor is the world with which the body mind is interacting. With this distinction, this is called guna karma vibhaga. That neither the body mind nor the vishayas, the objects with which the body mind interacts, none of them are me. See, the body mind and the world are in continuous change and action. Krishna said earlier in the chapter, you cannot um, stop action even for, yeah, yeah, even for an instant. Action at the level of the body, mind is continuously going on. The moment that I am identified with the body, mind, I think I am this, then I will be constantly caught up in action. And there is no way of withdrawing from that action. Uh, those who think that this is very bad and I will not get involved in this, I am going to separate myself from. Uh, I know in the Himalayas once, I was uh, staying in a little hut and this young man used to stay in a cave um, near, near my um, uh, hut and he would come and speak with me. Now he was not actually in, in any particular sense a spiritual seeker, he told me his story. He said that he had been working in Lucknow with a, a non-profit organization. In India, they are called NGOs. And he was very, he's a very idealistic young man. And then he told me that he got so uh, annoyed with the uh, internal politics and the petty little um, you know, personality clashes and even some corruption in that so-called idealistic uh, non-profit. So he got disgusted and he ran away to the uh, Himalayas. I will not get involved in all of this. So far, so good. He's staying in a cave and he's attending classes by a Swami in another cave. That's how it goes on there, <laughs> caves and huts. Uh, he came and shared his sorrow with me. He used to come and he, he told me, you know, the truth is, Swami, I don't like any, anything anymore. Kuch achha nahi lagta hai. So you see, if there is no intense spiritual desire that, that I will get enlightenment, I will have God realization, I must come out of samsara, get, get freedom. If that is not there, Simply irritation with the world and try to separate oneself from the world, it will just lead to depression and frustration. Um, that unhappiness is there. Um, so, you cannot, as long as one is attached to the body-mind as I am this, you cannot really uh, say that I will not be involved because you already are involved. This one, the body-mind is involved in the world. You are the part of the same material order, Prakriti. One more verse, then I'll take one or two questions and we'll move on to the main verse today. 29th verse. In contrast to this enlightened person, 29th verse again repeats the confusion of the unenlightened. Prakriter gunasam mudha sajjante guna karmaso tana kritsna vido mandan Krishna Vinda Vichalayet. So, those who are con confused or um, deluded by the constituents of Prakriti, the gunas of Prakriti, they get attached to the activities of these constituents. Sajjante Gunakarmasu. The one who knows the totality, Kritsnavit. Kritsnavit means Kritsnam means everything, not Krishna. Kritsnam means everything. Wit means no, the knower of everything. Knower of everything means the one who was referred to in the earlier verse, who knows body, mind is prakriti, matter, not me. The world is prakriti, matter, not me, made of sattva rajas tamas. So the whole thing is interacting with itself. I am the separate witness. You see, it's not even Advaita, it's a very, very Sankhyan uh, uh, framework. The, this is the person who knows the whole thing. Akrit Snavid. The one who does not know the whole thing, what do they know? They know, the one, one who does not know the whole thing, partial knowledge. They only know the world and body-mind. And they think, I am the body-mind and here is the world. Either I will engage in action or I will be spiritual, so-called, withdraw from, uh, from the uh, world. Those people, the one who knows the totality, should not disturb them, should not confuse them. Na vichalayat, vichalayat means confuse them. Confuse them by saying that you are the Satchidananda, what action for you, you, know, you are Brahman, uh, that will not help. So, that is the 29th verse. 
Prakriti guna sammodha, confused or deluded by the gunas of Prakriti, those who are attached to action. I want this, I do not want that and therefore I will try to get that and I will try to avoid this. If I succeed in my actions, I am delighted. If I fail, I am depressed. Uh, and this going from unhappiness to unhappiness. The knower of the totality should not disturb them. But you know what should, should this person do? Encourage them in dharmic action. The whole of, the whole of um, you know, the four levels of life, four stages of life, Brahmacharya, um, then Grihastha, then Vanaprastha, then Sannyasa was meant to bring about this maturity. Um, from, you see how it works. Just when you are young, a child or a teenager, it's me and mine. I want to be happy. I want to be successful. I, it's all for myself. Then you grow up a little more, become responsible. Parents, wife, husband, children, um, more and more one's activities become for them. So parents, you might say worldly, but notice the worldliness is actually not exactly for themselves. It's, it's almost entirely for the welfare of the children. So let, in their happiness is my happiness. In their success is my success. You see little expansion has come, not just me. Further expansion comes. If, there is, if a person is dharmika um, um, you know, and a thinking person, over years automatically a kind of maturity develops. That uh, why only these children, why only this little family which is connected to this body, I am thinking for the welfare of the community, welfare of all humanity, of all beings, this kind of expansion slowly comes. Um, so encourage people in action, but just make it dharmika action. So from adharma, immoral and unethical action to ethical and moral action. From ethical and moral action which may be with desire to ethical and moral action without desire, just for the sake of doing good to people. And from there automatically a spiritual quest will, is bound to come. Before we go to the next verse, is there, uh, somebody has a question? Shekhar? Yes. Yes, Swamiji, I have a question about Prakriti. Yes. If we, if we ask what is not Prakriti, is the answer Brahman? Answer is Brahman. The many words for it, Atman, Purusha, Brahman and it is you. It's your real nature. Whatever we can think of as object, this world, this body, this prana, these thoughts, this uh, intellect, even this ego, I, I, if you can experience it as an object, it's all part of Prakriti. Now, normally this is all that we know, my world and myself. What Krishna is telling us, the great secret he is imparting here is, neither your world nor this body and mind you consider to be yourself are you. You are not this. We have studied in Vedanta earlier, this is a drishya, an object, we are the witness of that. So, it's not even the mind, it's not even the intellect, it's not even the ego. The consciousness which illumines ego, aham. Consciousness which illumines intellect, mind, body I and mean, the senses, that consciousness you are. None of these things. All of these things are part of Prakriti, are products of Prakriti. So this is a Sankhyan framework in which a clear distinction is made between Purusha and Prakriti, Atman and Prakriti. They don't use the term Brahman. So Purusha means you, the consciousness and Prakriti is all that we are using, the body, mind, senses. Um, usually we do not know this secret, so we think we are the body, mind, senses. This person who has been born, I am a man, a woman, a father, mother, uh, I am this professional who is working, all of them are true. But that is not the entire story about you. That is why he has used the word Kritsnavit, one who knows the totality. We do not know the totality, we know only a small part of it. And that is why we get trapped. Hmm. This Prakriti of Sankhya is actually the Maya of Advaita. In Sankhya, Prakriti and Purusha are treated separately. You have to realize you are not the Prakriti, you are not the body-mind. That is what he calls Prakriti Guna. That we are not the products of Prakriti. In Advaita Vedanta, not only is Prakriti separate, and uh, it is also not real. It is the same Brahman which is appearing as Prakriti. So, in, a, in Sankhya, there is a duality. Prakriti Purusha is final. Ultimately, two things are there. Purusha, you the consciousness and Prakriti. 
and of course each one of his separate purusha that's a different matter advaita vedanta says no there is one reality you alone and you alone are appearing as prakriti in sankhya prakriti is real in advaita vedanta prakriti becomes maya which is an appearance not ultimately real one more person has Pooran. yes yeah pranam swami ji namaskar uh, i just namar swami ji i just wanted to uh, know if you can like elaborate on the term naishkarmya ah oh. naishkarmya means going beyond action and shri krishna at the beginning of third chapter when arjuna says tell me one path of action path of knowledge and what is in his in his mind he does not want the path of action because he does not want to fight this war anyway when krishna is pushing him to do his duty and do karma yoga fight this war without detachment he does not like that suggestion so what is in his mind is naishkarmya naishkarmya means transcending action and krishna teaches him i think the third verse of the third chapter is that by giving up action nobody transcends action na hi sanyasana deva naishkarmyam purushashnuti you do not enjoy the transcending of action just by taking sanyasa and not being engaged in the world it will become like that young man who was sitting in the cave and apparently witness uh, um, but he is saying kuch acha nahi lagta humko it's depression unhappiness that is true because uh, if you um, are uh, if you are uh, um, i just lost the track of my thought um yes so uh, if if one is uh, you know not does not have a higher spiritual goal even sitting in the himalayas after some time what will you see just rocks and water and cold and loneliness you feel unhappy after some time unless there is a spiritual goal which one is pursuing what is naishkarpya it is your real nature it's the real nature of the atman in the atman there is no action why action is in prakriti as we krishna is saying all action is done by prakriti we only don't know the difference actually your real nature is naishkarmya but that is not realized only by stopping action this example i gave suppose this is the world prakriti and this is you the bo- you means your body mind this is also prakriti now when this is engaged with this we say it's action when this withdraws from this i will sit in the mountain we say this is inaction but krishna says this is not inaction this is also a kind of action it's a kind of foolishness and the body mind and the world are continuously moving and they are in action together you have to realize you are apart from the body mind and the world that is real naishkarmya and that's the goal of karma yoga and gyana yoga does that address your question yes thank you so much thank you um now comes a beautiful verse 30th verse this is really the verse i wanted to talk about today we have time yes so all right we say all right krishna i have understood the enlightened person knows that i'm not the body and mind has understood the real secret of action body and mind continue to act but i am the um, unaffected witness but suppose i am not enlightened yet i have to be honest i do feel i am the body and mind uh, i am reading all this but i i get a idea about the witness but i feel i am this body and mind especially when i am not in zoom class when i am actually uh, in the world engaged in action i feel i am this person and i am acting so what do i do what is the practice sri krishna we would have said i mean telling you all this while karma yoga but sri krishna is not like that he again gives the whole teaching in a very beautiful verse 30th verse wonderful verse so let me just read out the verse verse number 30 mai sarvani karmani sanyasy adhyatma chetasa nirashir nirmamo bhutva yudhya svavigata jwarah surrendering all works to me mean, means krishna god by with a spiritual ideal or consciousness with a spiritual consciousness nirashir without desire nirmamo without attachment yuddhyasva engage in this fight that means your battle of life vigata jwara without literally it means 
being free from fever. That means being free from suffering and sorrow and anxiety. So what does this whole thing mean? Surrender or offer all your activities to me. Who? I, you the jiva who, is, who thinks that you are not yet enlightened. You don't really think of yourself as the witness purusha. You think of yourself as the body mind so far. All right, here is a practice for you. All the activities, yes, as body mind, as the jiva, ahankara, I am the person who is acting through this body and mind. In this way only, you continue acting. All your actions, activities, all means, sarvani means, laukika, vaidika. All your spiritual practices, your puja, chanting, meditation, plus all your secular activities, your walking, talking, cooking, driving, teaching, uh, business, everything, your uh, medical um, service, all of that. Do it as a worship of God. Mai Sarvani Sanyasya. Giving up, offering all of this uh, to me. To me means to Sri Krishna, to, to the Lord, to Bhagavan. Um, how will you? And Sanyasya means, uh, uh, important thing. Sanyasya literally means giving up. So here giving up means not giving up the activities. This is the teaching of Krishna. Continue the activities. You cannot give up. Continue the activities, offering them. Sanyasa means offering them to me, mentally like a puja. When you offer flowers, fruit, um, incense, similarly. How do you do that? Adhyatma chetasa, very important. What is the internal attitude? I am this jiva seeking enlightenment, God realization. I am the doer, I feel I am the doer. Aham karta, Ishwara, Ishwarasya bhrityavati, Shankaracharya says. Um, as a servant of Ishwara, Bhagavan, God, in whatever form you understand love and worship, the Lord is my master, I am the servant and I am doing this as my service to God. What? All your daily duties, all your um, religious act, um, worship, all your professional activity, everything is my offering, my service to God. The Lord is my master, I am thy servant. This is called Adhyatma Chetasa. The goal should be a spiritual goal. This is what he is saying. That there is an ultimate reality which I have to realize and this is my worship, this is my practice. And then Nirashi, without any desire of my own. It, uh, activities will go on, but it is not ultimately for satisfying my personal desires, which was the goal earlier. Nirmama, with detachment. It is not me and mine. Now all that knowledge will come useful. I have been taught this world is Prakriti. This body is Prakriti. I have not realized it yet, but I, I have been taught this. So this should be my attitude. It is not mine. Even the mind, the thoughts, the activity, the prana by which I get the energy, all my actions, karma, all of them, they belong to God. Up to the ego, even I, the one which is feeling I, I also belong to God. All of this entirety from the external world to the body, to the senses, to the mind, to the intellect, to the ego also. All of it belongs to God. No mama, not mine. Uh, Vigata Jwara, without any concern, without any anxiety now. See, desire and possessiveness, this leads to anxiety. All sorts of stress and strain, they come because of desire and possessiveness. It is mine and I want these things. So, when you say that it is not mine and all of it is worship of God, you will see immediately tension will go away. It is the Lord's world. It is the Lord's body. The children, the, um, the family, the um, company, the economy, coronavirus, all Lords. I give unto the Lord uh, everything that I experience. So, with this you will become unconcerned, serene because he is going to fight a war. So there will be a lot of stress and lot of unhappiness and tension and sorrow. You can see today, people are struggling with illness. There are doctors fighting life and death battles in the ICU and other places. There are people whose business is failing. There are people who are working who are afraid I may be laid off. What is the future? The students who are afraid, will I get a job afterwards? What, what about the health of my parents and my relatives and so on? So all of this tension, all of this belongs to the Lord, I offer it unto the Lord. Otherwise, jwara harsh, fever. He says, jwara means fever. Vigata jwara, without any tension. He says, 
teenagers, they, they use the term, all the Americans here also, be cool, being cool. The teenagers use the term, take a chill pill. Take a chill pill means to relax <laughs> and act, engaged in action, but relaxed. So, Sri Krishna is always portrayed in these books, you know, he is driving the chariot of Arjuna, and dynamic, his horses, he is holding them back in the middle of the battlefield, uh, place of action, but he always has a slight smile on his lips. So, <laughs> eternal, eternally relaxed, eternally calm, deeply calm in the midst of intense action. That is Karma Yoga, Swami Vivekananda's uh, description. It, um, eternal calmness in the midst of intense uh, activity. Vigata Jwaraha, Yudhyaswa, engage in the battle of life, don't withdraw, that is not spirituality. Now, quickly I will share with you uh, some insights from Swami Ramsub Das Ji. You know, he has a very nice commentary in Hindi called Sadhak Sanjeevani. So, um, I use a number of commentaries, Shankara's commentary always. Uh, now more and more Madhusudan's commentary, uh, Sridhara's commentary, I used to use it earlier. Uh, right now the book is not with me, it's in, uh, in my apartment at Harvard. Uh, and the Swami Ramsugdas is Hindi commentary, which is very nice. In this verse, he has given some uh, very wonderful observations, which I will quickly share with you. Then we can take a few questions. First, he gives a Shloka, beautiful shloka from Mahabharata, from the Shanti Parvan of Mahabharata. That shloka goes like this Duyaksharam bhavet mrityu, triaksharam brahma shashvatam, mameti cha bhavet mrityu, namameti cha shashvatam. This word of two letters, two letters are death, and three letters are the eternal Brahman. Two letters, mama, mine, the Sanskrit word, mine, mama. This is the two letters, mine, bhavet, mrityu, this is death. And the three letters, na, mama, not mine, means thine, not mine. Shashvatam Brahma is the eternal Brahman. So, such a powerful, small, I never, had never seen this verse earlier. Uh, in such a precise way and compact and powerful way, whole of Karma Yoga is given to us. Not mine, thine, my Lord. Yeah. Everything belongs to God. If you say what belongs to you, only God belongs to you. But everything else belongs to God. The world, body, mind, senses, intellect, even the ego, this I feeling, this little sentient being, I also belong to God. Then he gives a quickly several points. I will quickly run through them. Body, Prana, senses, mind, <coughs> none of them were ever ours. They are not ours. They will never be ours. What we think, it is my body, my mind, my um, projects in life, my desires. No, this is false. They were not ours. They are not ours. They can never be ours. And why not? He says, between the eternal and non-eternal, nitya or anitya, between the eternal and non-eternal, there can be no relationship. That which is continuously changing and you the consciousness which is beyond change, you cannot be tied. See, if you sit still and another person or say a dog is moving and you are tied with the, to the dog, you are you're holding a leash, either you will be able to pull back the dog or the dog will pull you. I have seen sometimes dogs are so powerful, they pull the person along rather than the person. <laughs> so, if you are connected to something moving and changing, you will be forced to move and change with it. But if you are unchanging by nature, you are beyond change. Pure consciousness, pure being, no birth, no death, no uh, change, no disease, no old age then you cannot be connected to this body which is, has got a birth and growth and old age and disease and death. It only appears to be connected. He says, mani we hai. You just think, you think that it's, it's, I'm connected to this body. Actually, you're not. In no place, in no way are you connected to the body or even the mind. Very powerful insight. You think about it. 
I am not the body, I am not the mind. I am not connected to the body, I am not connected to the mind. The body and mind are not mine also. I am aware of them, but they are not mine. They all belong to God. See, great relief will come if you think about it. And he says, all activities, you can surrender them to the world, you can surrender them to Prakriti, or you can surrender them or offer them to God. It, it's the same thing, it amounts to the same thing. World means, these. many people speak like this. See, I don't understand all your religion and everything. But I have some duties. I have to take care of my family and my children. I have some responsibility to my job. And I try to do a good job. So I really don't want anything from this. But this is what is the fact and I am trying to do my best. You are offering your work back to the world. You don't want anything. He says that's good enough. A deeper understanding is all of this is not the world. The world is nothing but Prakriti. The source is Prakriti. So Prakriti is doing everything, I am the witness, that's the second way, same thing. But this is better, it's, it's uh, the Sankhyan insight. But the Prakriti in Vedanta, Prakriti is the power of God, it is Maya. So if you offer it to God, all the activities, that's the best of all. So this is one interesting insight, world, Prakriti, God. You offer your activities to whatever you are doing without wanting anything behind, all will be um, spiritual. But the best one is to offer it to God. What about me? If I offer everything to God, no need to ask for anything. God will give you whatever we need. Once we do this, everything belongs to God, including I myself. Whatever I need will be given by God. He says, Karana, the body, mind, Upakarana, house, car, um, uh, gadgets, then activity, karma, the activities which I perform with these instruments. And I, the jiva, all of us, belong, everything belongs to God. And he says, this is cutting the links with Prakriti. Sankhya wants you to cut Purusha Prakriti Vyoga, separation. This is separation. Not actually trying to stop activity. Let everything go on. But I know this is my internal attitude. Adhyatma Chetasa. Internal spiritual attitude or spiritual consciousness. This he calls Sammandha Vicheda. This is cutting your relationship with Prakriti. Purusha and Prakriti are separated. This attitude. And so not physically, so the sannyasa does not mean actually I am going to give up everything. So I give away my house, uh, my gadgets and uh, all my uh, favorite possessions. Uh, what do they call? Yard sale or something. I am selling everything off. Uh, I divorce husband, wife and children. I say you go, you are orphans from now on. I am nothing to you. This is physical giving up. He says no, no, not physical giving up. All of it is offered to God. Mentally. And he says here, see the puja which we do, there also we are offering to God, the distinction, subtle distinction. My money, I am using it to do the puja. So I am giving what is mine to you and the internal attitude there is, so you give me something back. That is the attitude, a kind of religious bargaining that is at the heart of most conventional religion. I do a puja, I offer a um, uh, vrata, you know, offer a vow, observe a vow. Uh, I do something so that it is mine, I am offering to you, my Lord. Now I want something in return. You cure this disease, or you give me a job, or this. So this is conventional religion. And what Krishna is teaching here, no, no, not like this. Whatever belongs to you, that only I am offering to you. I, I recognize the fact that nothing, nothing here belongs to me, it is all thine. Then what will happen is, he says, uh, very sweetly, he says, Ishwara, God, is very pleased with this attitude. With when, if you bargain, you will get what you want. He says, if you give Vishaya to God, my Vishayas, my objects I give to you, my Lord. Then the Lord re returns the exact favor. My objects I will give back to you. Some, you will get what you want. That's it, finished. But if you give yourself and everything to the Lord, then the Lord gives himself to you. So you get infinity in return you get moksha. God is pleased by this attitude, he says. Then what happens is, all the work that you do and all the instruments that you use in work, they all become part of your puja. Whether you are driving, you are doing a computer call, um, you are taking care of the children, everything becomes part of puja then. It becomes a spiritual practice then. Activity goes on, 
Same activity goes on, but now it becomes a spiritual practice. Another point he makes is, desires will keep coming after this also. Say I make the surrender now. Then desires will keep coming because of the conditioning of the mind. Attachments will keep popping up. As desires come, as attachments come, as sorrow and reactions come, keep continuously offering it to God. So it is, it's a practice to be repeated. Whenever you have trouble, I am saying that I am detached and all belongs to God, not to me, but I feel this attachment, I cannot overcome, then offer it to God. Let the Lord take care of it, mentally do that. Um, then he uh, takes up this word, Yudhyaswa, fight the battle of life. And he points out the importance of work. He says in six, chapter 6, we will read, second verse it says, Aru Ruksho Muner Yogam Karma Karana Muchyati, third verse. For those who are climbing on the path of spiritual, not yet advanced, but we are moving upwards, work is the means, sadhana is work. And um, another place, 12th chapter, 12th verse, Dhyanat, he says, Dhyanat Karma Phala Tyaga, higher than meditation is Karma Yoga, giving up the uh, results of, of work. So work this, this fighting the battle of life, it is essential. Sri Krishna has again and again recommended it. Um, he also says, uh, the, which work, work is worse than battle? Why battle is mentioned here, Arjuna's battle. The worst kind of work in the field of action, the worst kind of action, the most terrible kind of action is war. And if Arjuna can do karma yoga in the midst of war, whatever is our act, activity in life, whatever we are, we are going to do, we should not think this is very unspiritual and spiritual activity is something else. So, in our own field of activity, in family, in job, in, in our day-to-day -day struggles, it can all be spiritualized. Last point, very interesting point he mentions, look at the verse. Yes, the whole verse is about Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga, um, the verse tells you that offer all activities to me. Mai sarvani karmani sanyasya. And adhyatma chetasa, with a spiritual attitude. And make, make sure, nirashi, there should not be any personal motive behind it. Nirmama, there should be detachment, it's not mine. And then uh, vigata jwara, free of anxiety. He says, look at this verse carefully. The first part, first quarter of it, mai sarvani karmani sanyasya, is bhakti yoga. Offering all activities to me. Adhyatma chetasa, with a spiritual consciousness, is jnana yoga. And the last line of the verse, uh, nirashi nirmamo bhutva, um, he says, yudhyasva vigata jwara, that is karma yoga. So, you, in this one verse, which is about karma yoga, but actually you find bhakti, jnana and karma together. Good, I am done and I have overshot time. Questions? Pranam Maharaj. Yes. I have so, uh, one thing that I have seen is, in terms of the three gunas, it's sometimes very easy to confuse uh, tamas by sattva. Yes. Very, very easy. Very easy. In hindsight, when I look back, I realize, oh, I just wasted the whole time. So, do you think cultivating rajas is a good idea? Or do you think this answer is based upon the age group of the aspirant? Or what are your thoughts on this? Yes. Sattva and tamas, serenity and uh, laziness, they look alike. Both seem very calm. But one is just sleepy, other one is calm and meditative. Um, so, tamas is overcome by rajas and rajas by sattva. So, the practice, the way of practice, it, there is a whole chapter which is Gunatraya Vibhaga Yoga will come up. The whole practice is overcome laziness by action. And um, uh, action is to be restrained by serenity. So, yes, one good way is to have a routine and stick to it no matter what your mood is. Uh, today I am lazy, today I don't feel like it, or today I feel uh, very restless, I will not do my meditation, no. Whether it is rajas or tamas, they have to be converted into sattva, because sattva is a good uh, basis for spiritual practice. Remember, even sattva is not spiritual, but it's a good basis for spiritual practice. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, when, I, uh, when I offer my actions to the Lord, 
sometimes I do bad things also, like I may get angry on somebody or I get I tell a lie. So I have hes- I hesitate. Should I can I offer this to the Lord also? True, true. You're supposed to offer everything to the Lord, and the Lord, believe me, uh, uh, knows us much better than we know ourselves. Uh, what we consider to be bad actions, you know, which we feel guilty about or which we feel unhappy about, are simply childish in the eyes of the Lord. But still, I understand what you mean. So there are certain things which we hesitate. What somebody who is very beloved to me, somebody who is very respected, uh, there are certain things that I will not do or offer to that person. So similarly, if, if that is so, then the Lord is the most beloved and the most respected. So how can I offer something ugly, something, uh, um, uh, something, you know, which is maybe sinful or I don't like it? Then you do not. But try to overcome. At least depend on the Lord that this is what is there. Please help me to overcome this. Yes. Very good. Uh, I get this feeling that I talk too much too fast. So, uh, maybe we'll try to do a little less so that more people can uh, participate next time. We can move a little more slowly then. But uh, is this all right? Uh, if you have any feedback also, you can write and let me know whether I should go a little more slowly or there should be more interaction. Huh? I still have to get used to this, this uh, format, this electronic format. Let me do the Shanti Mantra. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu. Um, chanting the verse together, yes, that would be good, that's a suggestion. But Zoom, the problem is, if you try to do something together, <laughs> Zoom gets confused because it will keep flipping back and forth between different uh, uh, speakers. That's the only problem with Zoom. Um, in one of the last classes which I had at the Divinity School, they tried to play a song which was sung by different people together in different countries. It was a mess. <laughs> Let me see all of you as we disperse. All right then. Now, thank you, Prakyat. And thank you for coming. I'm seeing so many people, some new faces. Yes. Kulen Babu is there. I can see. <laughs> Namaskar. Yes. Some place from across, right across the country, um, in the, on the west coast. Some from Texas, some from California. Yes. One or two are from India. Yes. That must be really early there. <laughs> Take care. Stay safe. May the Lord bless all of us. Jai Sri Ramakrishna. Jai Sri Ramakrishna.